We started back in 2000 when we um, canvassed. We went out to a predominantly black African American neighborhood and just had conversations with the residents there. And we learned a lot about the negative experience they were having with police officers. Um, they were um, stories of racial profiling, misconduct, police misconduct, and police abuse. Um, and those were um, the stories were um, at alarming rates. Um, and then uh, we then launched our racial justice hotline um, that we have had since since about that time off and on. And uh, even now, it's been what 14 years since 2000. And um, even now, we have the same stories. We have um, the same uh, around, around the same amount of um, communities of color being criminalized and discriminated. Um, and uh, in 2001, we also had um, a legislative um, data collection bill that helped us collect the data that we needed to further um, the 1201 bill in, in 2011. And what that data gave us is that um, there was a lot of disparities of searches for uh, our communities of color and uh, as well as people not just uh, driving, but also our pedestrians. And um, we have now um, been pushing to to see um, the change um, because, uh, as you see in, in the slide, um, people 65 percent of the people that have called our hotline feel discriminated and um, racially profiled, and people feel that they are still stopped unjustifiably, and um, that they um, are being harassed, searched, and even um, um, assaulted. Um, so that's that's where um, the the environment was and has been until now, and it's where we're we're pushing for change. Actually, the Know Your Rights was uh, a product of the catalyst after being pulled over and beaten almost to death by. Uh, Denver officers in 2009 just you know I was a juvenile first semester of college um, I was pulled over at about 1245 heading eastbound on a busy street in Denver Colfax and never having to know your rights training of my own in the past or even a class on how to interact with law enforcement um, I was told that I had made an illegal left turn and they wanted my information and they wanted my passengers information um, not even thinking twice about it I I told the officer, sure, you can have my information. I thought I may have made an illegal left turn. So being taken from the vehicle um, and patted down um, over the, an alleged aroma of marijuana and having my passenger harassed and handcuffed and then my car uh, rummaged through by officers and everything seemed normal until I approached the officers and asked them if I could see a warrant before they continued to search and that resulted in officers getting angry um, Officer Nixon, Officer Murr and Officer Middleton um, all three began to assault me. Ricky Nixon originally began to punch me in the face after stating I didn't have a license um, Officer Middleton and Officer Murr were grabbing me at the time and Middleton slipped backwards over the curb and drug all of us down on top of her and as soon as I was sandwiched between the officers and being hit from above by Officer Nixon and Officer Murr, Middleton began to hit me with a radio an unknown number of times uh, beneath my right eye. At this point, I heard another officer shout out that I was reaching for a pistol, and I was immediately grabbed around the throat after screaming out, No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I couldn't move. All I could do was, was barely tuck my head as not to uh, receive blows to my eye. I was hoisted backwards after being grabbed around the neck and struck multiple times in the top of the head with a police issue mag flashlight and then I was thrown back down on my face. Uh, when I was thrown back down on my face, Officer Middleton was no longer beneath me and other officers had arrived on the scene. We were, we were on 16th and Emerson and the District 6 police station in Denver is on 16th and Washington which is a block away. Um, so officers came by vehicle, officers came on foot and there was a multitude just beating me down and I hear an officer shout out if he doesn't calm down to shoot him and at this point I could see that an officer had removed a pistol I could feel the barrel pressed up to the side of my head I could see his hand gripping the handle so I went limp I went limp and lost consciousness and I awoke to officers laughing about what had just happened as if it was business as usual 
Uh, officers were joking. One officer said, I didn't know how close I was to getting my fucking head blown off. While another officer said, where's that warrant now, you fucking nigger? And while I was fading in and out of consciousness, I was drugged by my ankles and left to bleed out on the police jacket that you see in the slide. Um, after a paramedic arrived on the scene, I immediately asked why I was beaten so badly I had done nothing wrong. And they had told me to relax. They were paramedics. And I would not let them treat me until they took photographs of what happened. And these are the photographs that you see in the slide as well. These photographs <coughs> took um, roughly 45 minutes to obtain. I went into shock on the way to the hospital from rapid blood loss from my facial, facial lacerations. And meanwhile, the officer who accompanied me to the hospital um, was making rude remarks about how I didn't want to accept an IV. He was saying he can take a beating, but he doesn't want a needle in his arm. What a pussy. So I think that spoke to the culture and patterns and practices and need for Know Your Rights trainings that I later became engaged in. Um, after going through multiple battles uh, with a public defender um, against false charges, um, collaborated testimony, false statements. Um, they coerced my witness into a false statement. Uh, I was able to get all my charges dismissed and able to pursue civil representation. And after sifting through civil attorneys for months, I was able to find a firm and actually sue the city of Denver. And those same officers have been involved in repeated attacks against community. Within six months, Officer Randy Murray and Officer Ricky Nixon had been involved in two other very high-profile cases that were caught on videotape right here in Denver. And as I began to get more involved with Colorado Progressive Coalition, um, with other organizations who were fighting against police brutality and trying to expose uh, transparency and the lack of accountability provided by the city for the officers involved, in these types of actions, I realized after working with the hotline that we helped relaunch in 2011 that there are influxes of these types of cases coming from places like Five Points, Park Hill, Montbello, <coughs> the west side of Denver, and we've engaged in um, basic Know Your Rights trainings. Not the next slide. Please, please. Um, the Know Your Rights trainings in the slides here provided were done in both the Hiawatha Davis Center, it's a recreation center, in the town center in Park Hill, which is uh, one of Denver's predominantly black neighborhoods, and then Brother Jeff's Cultural Center, which is in the Five Points neighborhood, which is another one of Denver's black neighborhoods. And the idea behind the Know Your Rights training is to arm citizens, civilians, uh, bystanders, just people in the community with tools to navigate interactions with law enforcement. Um, we always start from the time the officer contacts the window um, to the time that the arrest is made, the detention, or the release of the individual. We always stress self-assessment. We always stress um, asserting your rights. In, in, For example, if you don't say to an officer that you don't consent to a search, that can later be used against you in a court of law. So these are things that we definitely try to teach people that they have the power to articulate in these types of situations, not to fear um, an officer's presence to the point to where you don't want to assert your rights. And a lot of people, we've realized through these phone calls on the hotline, make very simple mistakes uh, simply because they didn't know how to navigate the interaction with the law enforcement. They didn't have the know your rights training. They didn't have the self-assessment tools or the tools needed to navigate the interaction to the best possible outcome. House Bill 101201, uh, which is the consent to search legislation, um, was a product of, you know, years of, of work here at CPC within the racial justice program um, and especially the hotline. Uh, Tanya mentioned that back in 2000, uh, the Cole neighborhood was surveyed um, in a response to broken windows policing. I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with that. Uh, where law enforcement claims that in order to prevent violent crime, we need to crack down on small minor crimes. But in reality, um, broken windows policing is a tool for gentrification and urban renewal. Uh, and so the, the community in the Cole neighborhood uh, spoke out against broken windows policing. Um, and that survey 
uh, that Tanya mentioned uh, became the primary tool for Colorado's first anti-racial profiling law in 2001, uh, which was House Bill 01-1114. Uh, so, you know, that bill passed in 01, and it, it mandated uh, a couple of um, task forces be created, and those task forces to then create some reports um, speaking to data collection and so forth. And it also mandated that when officers pull you over and they don't cite you or there's no result of the stop, uh, that they have to provide you their, their uh, business card. Um, so, you know, a couple of years later after these reports came out, um, you know, we were able to actually point to empirical data that showed there's a definite problem when it comes to disparities uh, in the city of Denver, uh, especially, uh, you know, blacks and Latinos were you know, stopped at three and four and five times the rates of whites. Their their stops lasted uh, two and three and four times longer. Uh, they were searched three or four or five times as much as as whites. And so, you know, come 2010, we had these reports thanks to the work back in 2000 and 2001, and we were we were able to look to these reports and try to figure out, well, you know, how can we get rid of this problem? What can we do to kind of lessen this issue? Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the hotline was, was relaunched a second time, I think, back in 2009. And the hotline basically backed up what the reports and the data was showing around uh, racial profiling. And we realized that this issue of searching people when officers don't have consent or when officers don't have probable cause, to be more exact, was one of the main issues that was causing problems in the community. Uh, you know, people had a sense of their rights, and they had a sense when they knew their rights were being violated, uh, but they didn't know, you know, when it was actually taking place and what was happening. Um, so, you know, a lot of your cases regarding police brutality and excessive force began as a search where an officer didn't have probable cause but claimed that he got consent. Uh, from the individual in question. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea, um, you know, most searches require probable cause and reasonable suspension, but if an officer can get you to say, yeah, go ahead, look at my backpack, yeah, go ahead, do this, that you basically gave consent and you basically waived your right um, your, against unreasonable searches and seizures at that point. And people didn't know that they can refuse consent searches uh, they didn't realize that they had a Fourth Amendment right to say no to these consent searches, um, and and we and a lot of the data showed us. Uh, next slide, please. You know, a lot of the data showed us that uh, a lot of these stops were, you know, ended up in consent searches. Um, you know, 80, 86 percent of traffic stops and 83 percent percent of pedestrian stops. Um, led to actually nothing being found, you know, regarding these consent searches. Um, and, you know, when you talk about racial profiling, you're talking about people being stopped and harassed for no other reason for the community that, that they're in or for the color of their skin. And these consent searches were actually the racial profiling tool of law enforcement to make baseless stops. They were basically stopping people to, do, to go on fishing expedition uh, for drugs or check people's immigration status. Um, you know, so we basically thought if we could prevent and provide safeguards around these consent searches, uh, we think that would benefit our community. Uh, we think that will lessen the amount of stops, baseless stops and needless stops that were taking place that were actually turning into situations like Alex just explained. Um, and we also realized that if we could engage in a consent search campaign, you know, not only can we push back against law enforcement, but we could educate the community about their Fourth Amendment rights in the process. So it was kind of a dual campaign to provide for police accountability uh, as well as educate the community about their Fourth Amendment rights. Um, because like I said, the, the, the hotline was, was really revealing that, you know, things really went bad with police community interactions when people felt officers did not have a right to search them um, and that's when most things started to go downhill 
And, we, you know, we realized that police in Denver spent up towards 700 hours on traffic stops and consent searches, um, almost the same amount of time they spent for pedestrian stops and consent searches. So it was a real tool in their toolbox to basically legally engage in racial profiling. Um, so, you know, we thought by pushing back against consent searches, uh, we would limit the amount of racial profiling taking place, place in the community and also uh, educate the community about their Fourth Amendment rights. Next slide, please. So the, the campaign was, you know, a grassroots and a grass tops campaign. Um, at the time, we had two community organizing committees. Uh, one was made up of adults and one was made up of uh, high school kids uh, in various high schools where we would do Know Your Rights trainings. And those community organizing committees really uh, became the face of the campaign um, primarily when it comes to the city of Denver and the various um, agencies that were tasked with dealing with police accountability. Those community organizing committees were at meetings of uh, the independent monitor who oversees police accountability. Um, they were at, wherever the, this issue was brought up, the community organizing committees came forth and um, questioned legislators, questioned decision makers, um, and brought up this issue of racial profiling. Our youth community organizing committee did a direct action against D District Attorney Mitch Morrissey uh, because the hotline revealed that uh, a lot of people were getting charged with uh, intent to hurt a police officer or uh, police abuse and it was the exact same people who were actually being beat up by the police. Uh, so our community organizing committees made a lot of noise. They, they did a lot of the work on the grassroots side of things to spread the word. But we also, you know, had a kind of double-edged approach where we made sure we got a lot of grass tops people involved too. Uh, the public defender's office came on early. Uh, the ACLU of Colorado came on early. And we had two different frames for the campaign. You know, one frame was aimed at our uh, impacted community, and that frame was primarily racial justice uh, and police accountability. And then when it comes to trying to build the coalition, we used a individual rights frame where we talked about individual liberty, constitutional rights, and I think that really helped uh, get a lot of like Republican legislators on board. Um, so we, we went about it twofold, you know, like depending on the newspaper in question, we would draft a press release that was all about racial justice for certain newspapers. For other newspapers, we would draft a press release that was all about individual rights and constitutional rights and liberty. Um, and so <clears throat> we got a lot of people on board that um, didn't actually sign up. Uh, you, you see all the groups that signed up, but uh, we didn't actually get any like Republican groups or Libertarian groups to actually sign up, uh, but they quietly supported, and that support helped um, during the legislative campaign as we, went, as, as we moved forward. Um, you know, also House Bill 1201 was meant to assist the undocumented community uh, because as you all likely know, the majority of deportations are for traffic violations or minor marijuana possession. And we thought if we could put up some barriers uh, for law enforcement to, you know, not needlessly search um, individuals that that will naturally have a benefit for the undocumented community. Um, the at, at, Hans Meyer worked for Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition at the time. He primarily helped me draft uh, the legislation. Uh, but Colorado Immigrant Rights Com um, Coalition decided that they would stay quiet on the initiative uh, because they did not want to bring forth the opposition that they had regarding uh, immigrant rights into this issue of racial profiling. They didn't want it to take over. So they were a big part of what was going on behind the scenes. but. Uh, they decided to stay quiet. I didn't agree with it at first, but um, I, I think it, it probably worked out in the end. <clears throat> so we had the immigrant rights community. We had uh, the faith-based community on board. Uh, we even had like jobs for justice uh, because you, as you realize, you know, the more people are stopped in so-called high crime areas and communities of color, the harder it is for them to get employment if, if some contraband was found. Uh, so we were able to have a kind of broad coalition uh, that really looked to uh, help the impacted community in question 
from a wide variety of, of angles. Um, and, and so the, the hotline really was the, was the primary um, foundation in the campaign. A lot of the people who testified at the uh, legislative uh, committee hearings were people who came directly from our hotline. Uh, we had an 85-year-old World War II vet uh, who basically was the star of the campaign down at the courthouse. Uh, you know, once he told his story, um, you know, law enforcement, who was the opposition, the only opposition was uh, law enforcement, uh, the district attorney's council, the chiefs of police, and the sheriff's association was the only opposition. And simply put, we, we whooped their ass. I mean, they came with nothing but, um, you know, scare tactics. Uh, they really had no way to fight this proposal without admitting to a lot of the foul tactics and that they engage in on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think that's about it when it comes to the campaign. You know, like I said, it was it was grassroots and grass tops, and it was a fairly broad coalition. And the, the vast majority of Republicans supported it, uh, just as much as the Democrats. And you know, maybe because Colorado kind of has a strong libertarian streak, where people realize when the government is overreaching. You know, that could have helped us out. We also had a, a brand new black president at the time. I think a lot of people were willing to push back against law enforcement because our chief executive officer at that time was a black guy. So I think a lot of things came together um, that made it all work out. And um, the implementation uh, was another issue. You know, the attorney general's office is the, the office uh, that is supposed to deal with oversight. Uh, so that was a completely whole other fight that I wasn't able to engage in before I left CPC on the level that I wanted to. Um, but as you know, you can always pass laws, but implementation is everything. But at least we have these laws on the books. Uh, trainings are still going on five years later. Uh, and, you know, I would like to think that it definitely had a benefit. Yeah, so the me sort of think about lessons learned, um, I think there are a few takeaways for other folks who um, are interested in doing campaigns like this. Um, I think, you know, as Alec talked about, one of the big takeaways is to build a very um, broad coalition of support um, from the community and uh, sort of from us talks. I think, as Alec has mentioned, one of the giant successes of this bill was that it brought together so many different kinds of organizations and people, um, and it's one of the reasons why we were able, able to get it passed. Um, I think another lesson learned um, is that the messaging frame can shift for different communities. You know, obviously the messaging frame we use with uh, CEC of members and communities of color, the sort of police accountability frame, the frame that was used for more conservative and libertarian legislators was um, government overreach. Um, and so, you know, those there's different messaging frames in different communities and with different people that can also be uh, really, really effective. Um, I think the other thing we've known is I'll talk about implementation. So determining the effectiveness of this bill has been uh, difficult, uh, especially because many of the stories that we're collecting are just not individual stories with people's anecdotes. Um, and, and We've also known that this bill and this piece of legislation is only as effective as the people who know about it. Meaning, the know your rights trainings are a huge and important component of this bill. Um, if people don't know this bill exists and they don't know that um, they're supposed to be asked to consent to a search, it's not effective. Um, I think, you know, the implementation, as I mentioned, has been a little bit more challenging than um, getting it passed. And implementation is still something that we are working on. I think, in hindsight, some sort of um, data tracking provision that has, you know, improved the effectiveness. Um, but, as I said, this is a really, really good start for our communities. Um, and it's a really good start 
to you know killing police accountable um, and sort of curbing some of the nefarious tactics that they had been using to um, racially profile um, people. And so, I think, you know, in hindsight, lessons learned some positive and, and also some things that we would perhaps think differently. But, yes, so if, even though we're still working on implementation and the Know Your Rights piece is ongoing, this is a really, really important step um, in the right direction. So part of our implementation is keeping the hotline alive and uh, that's what we have been doing. Um, the map on the screen shows um, the calls that, that we have gotten in the past two, two to three years. Um, and our, our tactics is to just go out into a community and knock on doors, um, talk about the hotline, give them that you know resource and then invite folks to a Know Your Rights training uh, where we'll talk more about, about their their rights and and the Toba one and um, part of the of the law because as Hillary mentioned it is it the law is as good as as many people know it and that's where we want to go um, and we also um, because Colorado it's uh, a place where a lot of police violence happens uh, there's um, a lot of cases going on all the time and we get a chance to um, along with, with the stories that come out, talk about what, what the work is like on the ground and what we're doing to stop that. And um, it's, it's a chance for us to talk about our hotline. Um, our hotline is volunteer run, so it's, it's um, managed by, um, by myself, but volunteers, our members, are the ones that take the, the initial calls. And then we, we help to follow up, and um, what we support is... Um, is filing a complaint against the police department and or um, give them a list of um, legal resources that they can uh, later talk to if they uh, have a case of civil rights violations from police officers. And um, it's, it's, it's been a tool, it's definitely been a tool to building power here in Colorado and um, although we do a lot of our <coughs> organizing um, in um, predominantly African-American communities because of um, of how the environment is at the moment and immigration, a lot of our calls are from immigrant families who, um, by a simple stop, traffic stop, um, end up in the deportation proceedings. So um, that's also the community that we're, we're working with at the moment and trying to um, support. Um, and that's just um, a little bit about our hotline. Um, we hope to, to continue the work and um, continue having those conversations about implementation with the gas stops that need to uh, reinforce this um, because it's, it's a lot. It's in the books and we need to need to see it on the streets. And I think uh, with the stories that keep coming in, that's um, officers telling um, people, pedestrians and people in cars that they have a right to refuse to search is not being um, done. So that's that's the big next fight, I believe, with CPC. I think another important factor of the hotline is we've yeah. seen that the police have a database that is really inaccessible to community members. There's no transparency. So another thing that the hotline provides is a civilian style database that allows us to track concentrated areas of police misconduct and we can make that information then available to the public um, which is something that we haven't seen before um, we haven't seen the city take an initiative on doing so I feel like the hotline does provide us with a civilian database that really breaks it down in a digestible format. I'm wondering if you can talk about um, well I guess two things one I guess in the weeds the policy itself what's in it what does it look like um, and then how is it implemented on the ground, like in a very practical way? Can um, Alex or Eric maybe want to take that question? Yeah, the policy itself um, basically says when an officer wants to search someone and they don't have probable cause, they don't have reasonable suspicion, um, in order to search a person in those circumstances, you have to provide that person, you have to ask that person for their consent. 
Uh, and so what the law requires is officers must tell people that they have a Fourth Amendment right to refuse the search in light of the fact that the officer does not have probable cause or reasonable suspicion to make the search any other way. Um, so, so basically it's a matter of law enforcement being put out there on the streets to, to inform people of their Fourth Amendment right to refuse a search. Um, there's, there's three or four different types of searches that law enforcement engage in. Uh, the most common search is incident to arrest. Whenever you're arrested, you're searched before you're booked. Um, another very common search is called a cursory search or a Terry frisk. Whenever an officer says that his, his safety is in danger, the safety of the general public is in danger, or the safety of the person in question is in danger, they could pat you down and search for weapons. Really, they're patting you down to search for contraband in that situation. Uh, there's really nothing you can do regarding these type of searches. These type of searches are legal um, based on Supreme Court rulings, uh, but the consent search is another type of search that an officer would engage in when they didn't have probable cause, when they weren't making an arrest, and when they didn't really have the facts to say that safety was at play in order to engage in a, 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 a Terry frisk. So they would basically tell people, let me look in your backpack or else, you know, I'm going to come down on you harder. You know, it, the consent searches are really about abuse of power and we were trying to level the, the, the playing field by making sure officers, when they tried to engage in this practice, had to tell people that they had a constitutional right uh, to refuse the search. I mean, you know, we've talked about the ground game. You know, it's just a matter of know your rights trainings, letting people know that the law exists, um, canvassing regarding the hotline, and just getting out there in the community with the media as best as possible. Um, so, you know, that's what the ground game looked like before the law passed and right after the law passed. Um, we initially targeted the Attorney General's office so that he will provide trainings to local law enforcement agencies about this law. All he decided to do was send out an email, which is basically like a bulletin about the law. So that's where we were when I left it. It was just all about doing our best to make sure the Attorney General's office was proactive about teaching people about this law. But I mean, what y'all have to realize is law enforcement, they can adapt to a, to a lot of the things we do, but it's important for us to keep them on their toes and make them adapt. And that's what this legislation did. It made them change their, st their game up a little bit. Um, but, you know, of course, only the police police the police. Um, so we'd have no idea what actually goes on, and they're used to abusing their power, uh, but at least we have some stuff on the books. Public defenders used this law immediately after it passed and got a couple people off for some, some uh, illegal searches. Um, so, you know, you, you have to do what you can do, but you have to do that realizing that law enforcement has a ton of power, and they're used to abusing it. They know how to abuse it in a legal fashion in many ways, and all you can do is keep them on their toes and make them um, change up their game every once in a while. Uh, we've got another question in chat uh, from Virginia Camberos. Do you have trainings and the hotline uh, resource translated into Spanish? Yes. Uh, Spanish is actually the only language we have the materials translated into, and that's because I speak Spanish and I'm, I'm able to do the follow-up and do uh, the stories. Um, but we have had... Uh, stories come in from other languages and we just find the resources uh, of the person that's able to speak with the family or the person and um, help us, you know, do follow up with, with that specific um, case. Um, but yeah, we do have all the all the materials, even the maps um, that I just showed. Um, we, we really try to push forward um, on having at least Spanish and English. The message on the phone is Spanish and English. And um, all the all the posters and flyers and cards are all bilingual as well. The Know Your Rights trainings are also available in, in English or Spanish.